All right. Well, I think we're all more or less here. I think I'm more or less here. Um, we'll begin, I guess, with a prayer. No, we will most definitely begin with a prayer, because that's what St. Benedict says to do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, dear God, finish what I start today. Give us, in the meantime, patience and wisdom to discern your holy will for us. Give us humility, but be gentle about it, please. And we wrap up all of our petitions, every one of our petitions, in the mantle of your mother, as together we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Joseph of Cupertino, pray for us in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, Saint Joseph, yes, Saint Joseph, that's Kylie or Kaylee back there somewhere, I think. Good job, Kaylee. You can cheer anytime you like. Um, the um, Saint Joseph of Cupertino is another one of my favorites. He was a Franciscan and was exceedingly stupid. And he failed, he wanted to be a priest more than anything. He kept failing his exams. And finally the bishop said, look, if you can just answer one question on this exam, I'll ordain you. And he did, he answered one question correctly on the whole exam. And anyway, it turned out he was so holy that he would levitate whenever he prayed. And it only took mentioning the name of Jesus to launch him into the deepest prayers. So little kids would run around after him saying, Jesus, and then he'd go, and they all go, yay. <laughs> and it became a real problem for his brethren because people would come from miles around to watch him float around. And uh, they used to tie him to his choir stall so that he wouldn't float around during prayers. And, and the story they tell is that he was in his cell and this princess from a neighboring uh, hamlet, uh, this is in Italy in the, uh, near Assisi, came to visit him uh, because he was kind of famous now and she wanted to see what a saint looked like and he didn't want to meet with her because apparently she was very pretty. So he asked the prior to not let her in, but the prior said, look, she's got a lot of money, we kind of need her to visit, you know. So anyway, he prayed really hard and floated out the window. <laughs> and. Uh, so he's the patron saint, I tell my students, he's the patron saint of stupid people and airplane pilots, <laughs> which he is. Um, he's also the patron saint of students. Um, so we've kind of, I've kind of done this backwards, I realized. We started with failure, which really ought to be the end. Um, and now today we're going to talk about humility, which ought to have been at the very beginning. And then tomorrow we're going to talk about decision making, which ought to have been in the middle. So it's all reversed, but um, tomorrow will be the really sort of heavy duty, heavy hitting, theological sort of academic sort of stuff. We're going to talk about the Desert Fathers and what it takes to make a decision. Uh, today is going to be largely what I was paid or not paid to come do, which is to talk about humility. And if you've read the book, you can just sort of sleep through this because most of it uh, is, is, is from my book. Um, and if you, so you don't have to take notes or you can just leave now if you've read it and same old stuff really. Um, with a little bit of extra stuff added. Oh, I did promise to answer some questions and, and one was why I'm big on sharks and, and they said they could put it up there on the screen. So. Uh, the reason I have a shark on my computer screen, and I, I can't remember the exact wording of the, are you, are you here tonight? Do you who asked that? Yeah, do you remember, what was the question again? Oh, the story of the shark attack is best explained by uh, Fox News, I think. It's only like two minutes Can forgive long. bathers in Ocean County, New Jersey, if they're a little skittish these days. That after multiple shark sightings within the past week. Bathers spotted a pair of five-foot-long sharks yesterday in Seaside Park and Seaside Heights. 
We're also getting shark reports from Tom's River and Berkeley Township. And while there is no scare like in the movie Jaws, it is hard for sunbathers to get the image of all those teeth out of their heads. New Jersey correspondent Nora Mishanek is live in Seaside Park tonight. Nora. Hi there, Jim. That's because that's the movie that sticks in everyone's mind, but that's not what's going on here. There are sharks in the water this week, but they're nowhere near the size of Jaws. Now, luckily, one surfer who had a close encounter with a shark yesterday, well, he apparently had someone up above watching down on him. He was about 8 to 10 feet and not more than, I'd say, uh, 20 feet away. His students call him Father Dude. He's a Benedictine monk who teaches high school in Missouri and yesterday while on vacation came face to face with a shark in the water off Seaside Park. And there's just this great dark shape beneath the surface and these two fins, the dorsal and the tail fin. And uh, I didn't take a long time to look at it. I pumped the board around and started paddling like crazy. Alarm bells went off again today when lifeguards just south of Seaside at White Sands Beach in Berkeley Township spotted two more sharks in the water just after 9 a.m. Fortunately, there was no people, but I did. Go, we did go up and down the beach, all the people uh, sitting on the beach, to tell them about the shark. Don't go in the water until we, we say it's all clear. They said we can't go in, and then they saw another one about a half hour later, <laughs> and we were just waiting for the sight. My husband's definitely afraid. Terrified. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. Right on the edge. I'll touch my feet in, but I'm good. You're not going in. No chance. Experts at Jenkinson's Aquarium in Point Pleasant say the sharks that have been sighted this week are likely common species like this, sandbar or sand tiger sharks. They regularly inhabit the waters here, but are infrequently seen. The sharks don't eat people. They're more interested in smaller animals and they're just cruising around looking for something and moving on. Lifeguards have temporarily banned swimming in several towns when the shark sightings occur, and while they eventually move on, the mere presence here has unnerved some. It's scary. It reminds us of yours exactly. My kids were too young to remember that movie, but I remember that movie. And that's why so many people are a little jumpy about sharks in the water. Of course, the beach patrols are keeping a close watch, and so far, that Benedictine monk on the surfboard is about as close as anyone has come in terms of having an encounter with the sharks. Thank goodness he says his prayers. Live in Seaside Park, I'm Nora Mushanik, Channel 6 Action. So that, does that answer your question? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, it was, it, there was uh, less to that story than they mentioned, actually, because it, your odds, it turns out your odds of getting eaten by a shark even if there's a hungry shark nearby, are much less than being trampled by a moose or, or a pig. Like, pigs are more dangerous than sharks. But I guess there's something about having them under the water that you can't see them, and it makes it kind of scary. But, yeah, I went out surfing, and there were only, like, three of us out there because the surf was up, but they, they'd spotted these sharks out in the water. But I only get three weeks a year to go surfing, so, uh, you know, you take your chances. And... We were out there joking around, and I was saying, he's going to come after you guys because you're smaller, you're bite-sized. And they were like, he's coming after you because you're bigger and, you know, you're more of a meal. And then we're laughing, and then one of them starts going, shark, 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 you know. And just like in the horror movies, I was like, ha, 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 very funny, you know, good joke. You know, they look around like, oh, sh <laughs> shoot, 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 oh, shoot. And... Uh, I learned, uh, anyway, the, uh, yeah, I, the, um, I learned pretty quickly, well, actually, I learned two things that, that afternoon coming back to shore. One was that you can't paddle a surfboard if you don't put your f hands in the water. <laughs> and the other one was that, uh, you know, the, there are a lot of things in our lives that seem really important at the time that when you're being chased by a shark suddenly don't feel that important anymore. Uh, which is why St. Benedict tells his monks to meditate daily on the hour of their death. Um, now, so we're going to talk about humility today, and um, I've literally written the book on humility, so I guess that makes me an authority. Um, the point of it all, of course, is death, is looking forward to the day of your death. And um, in fact, we just recently lost our father, Paul. He died two weeks ago. He was buried last Saturday. And he died of colon cancer. And I, when, when, he, when he was diagnosed with it, and it was just all through him, it was inoperable, I said, oh, I'm really sorry to hear this, Father Paul. And he said, are you kidding? I've been praying my whole life for a slow, painful death. <laughs> 
I was like, are you I was like, what? And he said, no, no, no. I want to get all my purgatory out of the way. Just so, and I want to be well prepared. I just want to, you know. And he was. But it didn't take him that long to die. But he, uh, he was looking forward to it. Um, which is not unusual for monks. Um, we, in fact, in my monastery, the, the rooms of the senior wing uh, overlook the graveyard so that they can know where they're going. And they like it that way. They like it. They, Father Luke used to say, look, say, that's where I'm going, right there. Right? Just dig the hole from now and just throw me out the window. In fact, I was walking past his room one afternoon and he was sort of looking out the window and I said, good morning, Father Luke, how are you? And he goes, ah, just waiting to die. <laughs> and I said, are you okay? And he said, yeah, yeah, but you got to have something to look forward to, right? Uh, so monks look forward to the day of their death. And if we have time at the end, I'll tell you about Brother Ed, but uh, there, uh, there are some in the audience who have heard that story like five times already, so I'm going to skip Father, Brother Ed for the time being. Um, but I might highlight him in red in case we have time at the end to talk about him because Brother Ed taught me a lot about death and, well, and about holiness in his own weird sort of way. Um, oh, heck, I'm just going to tell you the story. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, those of you who have already heard it are just going to have to hear it again because he, at the, Brother Ed was, was not a saint, but, but he, was, he was a monk, <laughs> Uh, he and I didn't get along, actually. The Brother Ed was crazy. Um, and, and every monastery has a crazy monk because monasteries are little microcosms of the church. They, we have smart monks and stupid monks and hardworking monks and lazy monks and fat monks and skinny monks. and It's just a, a complete little church. And every monastery, every monastery I know of has one really nutty monk. And by crazy, I don't mean that he was like, you know, crazy, bro. I mean, he was like, he had invisible animals in his room that talked to him. Uh, and he was also obsessive. He, he was, he, everything had to be perfectly neat, right? He would come in about 10 minutes early to prayers and line up his books. He'd spend like 10 minutes lining his books up perfectly. When he died, we, we went into his room and the furniture was glued to the floor, so that it would be where he needed it. In fact, and the lamp was glued to the table. There was like, there was a pencil glued to the table so it would always be where he wanted it, right? Um, and, but he was also kind of, and he was also kind of a genius though, in addition to being nutty. Um, he, he, at the age of 85, he taught himself the harmonica because he was a big fan of bluegrass. So he taught himself over 500 bluegrass tunes. He couldn't read music, so he invented his own notation based on colors. And we've got volumes of just nothing but colors in our archives, and nobody can read them, but they're music, apparently. Um, and he was an authority on Ernest Hemingway. He, he actually had in his cell a copy of an, an autographed first edition of The Sun Also Rises, uh, which he never let me see because he, uh, Brother Ed and I did not get along uh, for obvious reasons. Um, I mean, in addition to the fact that we sat next to each other for eight years, and I'm a mess, and I'm never on time, and I, my books are all over the place. I kind of pile them up in my choir stall. And I may have rearranged his books once or twice just to, <laughs> just to see what would happen. And... Um, so he and I were, were always on each other's nerves. And, and that has to be a very quiet affair in a monastery because, you know, we're, we're, my monastery is pretty strict. And so when you have a fight, it's more like, you know, and that's pretty much the extent of it. Um, but then, then after I was done with my novitiate, strangely, the abbot, and what was perhaps the worst administrative decision of all time, put me in charge of the kitchen, and then put Brother Ed in charge of the dishes. Uh, and Brother Ed was meticulous, so putting him in charge of the dishes made sense, but I was a terrible kitchen master. I mean, just the worst. Like, the monks just didn't eat sometimes, because I just didn't remember to feed them, you know? And, and... 
And, and Brother Ed and I were always, always on each other's cases, always rubbing, raw, rubbing each other raw. And um, finally, the abbot just gave up and said, look, you go away to Oxford and study, because that's what you're good at. I'll get somebody else to run the kitchen. And as a thank you to the monastery, I, uh, I made a big feast for the monks. It was, a, it was awful, actually, but the, the last course was really good. It was a chocolate almond tort. In fact, I made seven for the monastery. There are only 22 monks in my monastery, but I made seven chocolate torts so I could be sure that I had an extra for later. And, um, yeah, it's not... I, when the abbot made me director of vocations, I, I went into his office and I said, really? He goes, yeah. And I said, but I'm a terrible monk. And he said, yeah, but your heart's in the right place. You know, so go figure. Um, but in any case, he, um, I made this extra chocolate tort for myself. And once the feast was over and I'd cleaned up the kitchen and, and everything was in its place, I, I cut myself a piece of chocolate tort and I wrapped it in uh, aluminum foil and I hid it in the fridge behind the mayonnaise because note to any future monks out there, if you ever want to hide something in a monastery, hide it behind the mayonnaise because nobody touches the mayonnaise. Um, and, uh, and I woke up extra early the next morning and I got my favorite chair and I put it on the back porch and I, I got, a, I made myself a cup of coffee and got a good book and I sat down and I went and I got my chocolate tort out of the fridge. But when I opened it, when I unwrapped my chocolate tort, someone had been there first. Yeah, and, and, and not just eaten my chocolate tort, had taken a bite out of my chocolate tort. Like I could see the teeth marks in the chocolate tort. It slobbered all over my chocolate tort and then somehow wrapped it up exactly as I had left it. Like, and then put it in exactly the same spot in the fridge, you know? And, and the depths of rage that welled up inside of me. Uh, I mean, I cried out to God for vengeance. I mean, my whole ruin, my whole morning was just ruined. And there was really only one person in the monastery capable of that kind of meticulous insensitivity, you know? And uh, so I, but I swallowed my rage and I, I went and I cut myself another piece of chocolate tort and I wrapped it in silver foil and I put it back in the fridge. But first, I soaked it in Lee and Pepper's super hot Cajun sauce, right? And the next morning, when I woke up and came down to the kitchen, there was chocolate tort sprayed all over the wall, right? And it was like the greatest moment of my life, right? I mean, vengeance was truly mine. And, and you know, you can't say a lot in a monastery, but when I'd see Brother Ed walking by, I'd be like, is it hot? Is it hot? <laughs> so he knew, he knew what was going on. And, and uh, yeah, it wasn't one of my greatest moments. Um, but anyway, I, I ended up going off to Oxford and a couple of months in, I got an email from the abbot telling me Brother Ed had gotten really sick, um, had cancer. It had nothing to do with the chocolate tort. Uh, and then I started to wonder whether maybe I could have handled that a little differently. Um, you know, I, I got to thinking, you know, he's a sick old man. He's obviously crazy. You know, I could have made him his own chocolate tort, right? Could have, could have put it, could have made a chocolate, could have cut his own piece, put his name on it, wrapped it with a bow for crying out loud. I mean, who cares? It was a chocolate, piece of chocolate cake. Um, and then, of course, a couple of months later, he died, and then I felt really terrible. Um, anyway, to make a long story a little longer, I came back from Oxford, and when I got to my room, I opened the door, and there was a package on the table in my cell, a little brown paper package wrapped in um, uh, an old grocery bag and tied with twine and taped and uh, I had a suspicion I knew who it was from, but I, I opened it, I, I pulled the, the twine off, and I opened the book, and it was Brother Ed's copy of The Sun Also Rises, right? And it had a little sticky note on it that said, sorry, right? 
So this is, uh, and, and I think this is why, you know, A, this is why Father uh, St. Benedict forbids grumbling. And B, it's why he tells us to meditate on our death. Because there are just these little things in our lives, turning the thermostat up or down or whatever, that just become so huge to us, that just just eat us up, you know, these, these little, these conflicts. Um, and when you begin to think about them, they, they start to, if you think about them in the context of death, like all of a sudden they become... Well, they, they're put in their place. I, um, I was going to save this for tomorrow, but I think I'll tell you about it now. I, um, when my sister got married, I asked, uh, she asked me to give the toast at her wedding. And I don't know what to say at somebody's wedding. I'm not, I don't have a dog in that fight. I'm never getting married myself. I don't care. So I didn't know what to say, and I, I went and found old Father Patrick in his room, because when I need something to say, I, or when I'm confused about anything, I go and I see one of the old guys. Um, and I walked into his room and I said, hey, Abbot Patrick, good morning. And he woke up, he was sitting in a chair, asleep. And I said, uh, I, got a, I, I need your help on something. And he said, certainly. And I said, I need to give a toast at my sister's wedding. What do I say? And he said, ah. You tell her that the day will come when he will want the window open. She will want the window closed. And then he went back to sleep. <laughs> and I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> but I gave the toast. I, I, they, they, my time came, I stood up and I said, the day will come, Kristen. When you will want the window open, and he will, and everybody thought I was wise, you know, and people were like, oh, explain that to us. I'm like, I'm sorry, you'll just have to live your way into the answer. You know, I, 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 well, I, I can't, I can't, no man can dictate another man's path, you know, but I still had no idea what it meant. Um, until a couple of years ago, I was saying Mass for the Missionaries of Charity, and they're great. I mean, if you've never spent any time with Mother Teresa's nuns, you got to do it just for the just for the laugh. Uh, I mean, they're just hilarious, and they don't even mean to be. They're all about this big, and they all look like these. Even the Americans, they end up looking like these. Um, I, I actually have a friend who joined them, and she's from Canada, and she now she talks like these. She's like, oh, Father Augusta, now what are you? I'm like, are you still from Canada? Um, and uh, but but I was I was given a it was. Oh, I remember, I actually remember the readings that day at Mass because it was Jacob and Esau and how Jacob put uh, lamb's wool on his arms to make himself look like his brother who had hairy arms. And she kept saying, and, and, I, and Isaac said, you are Esau, my fuzzball. I was like, what? You are Esau, my fuzzball. It said, uh, my fuzzball? Because <laughs> e it made sense, but she was saying firstborn and by the time I got to the sermon, I had totally forgotten what I meant to say. I was just thinking about Jacob, his fuzz, uh, Esau, his fuzzball. And so I said, well, there are many things I could say about this passage, but I'll just leave you with this. Someday, one of you will want the window open. <laughs> and the other will want the window closed. And then I sat down and I thought, and then I got back up and I'm like, look, I can't lie to you. I have no idea what that means, right? Because you can't lie to a missionary of charity, right? And, and then I sat back down, and they all giggled. They said, oh, Father, you're so funny. You're all, all. And one of them came up to me at the end of Mass, and she was like, well, I know what that means. Uh, I won't try to tell the whole story in her accent. But she goes, uh, she said she was assigned to a house near the Amazon. And she's from India, which is pretty hot, but apparently the Amazon is really hot. And, uh, and they had, there were six of them living in this uh, this metal hut and they had two windows and a door and one of the six was actually from that area and every night she would come in and shut the doors and all the windows right before they went to bed and she said every night she'd come in we'd have the windows open we'd all be lying in bed she'd get up and she'd close all the doors and the windows and she, every night they'd just steam silently praying year after year that she'd get transferred and eventually she was, 
And they, ce- they, they, they celebrated by opening all the windows and the doors. And they, she said, it was wonderful. We slept, she said, all night with this cross breeze. And we woke up the next morning with snakes in our beds. <laughs> and she said, you, you want, the, what your abbot was trying to do, what your fa- old monk was trying to tell you, was that you need to assume first that the people you live with want what is best for you, right? They may not. <laughs> They may be jerks, but you assume first that they want what's best and then move from there. And it turns out, I was, I was reading this, uh, I'm writing this book on decision making and I've been reading these psychology books. And there's this term, if you ever want to sound super smart, you can use it, called the fundamental attribution error, all right, in psychology. If you want to sound super smart, you can talk about this. And it's, the idea is that you attribute to other people. See, when somebody around you does something really jerky, you say, that guy's a jerk, right? Somebody cuts in front of you in line at the grocery store. It's because he's a jerk, right? You attribute his motives to him being a jerk, a character flaw. But if you cut in front of someone else in line, it's because you've had a horrible day, you're in a terrible rush, it's an emergency, and you're sure they'll understand, right? And it's not an, an issue of charity, it's just an issue of logic, right? You apply the same criteria to yourself as to other people. Another way of putting it is, you're on the highway, right? Everybody you pass is a moron, and everybody that passes you is a maniac, but you're like the one person on the highway that has picked the exact right speed, right? Because you attribute to other people's errors to their character, but you attribute to your own errors circumstances, right? And, and forget about charity for just for a moment. It's just illogical. You should, ex- you should apply the same criteria to everyone. So this guy cuts in front of you. He may be a jerk, right? But you won't know till you ask. You say, oh my gosh, are you in a hurry? Are, are you having an emergency? Did you not see me here? Is, are you okay? And then he goes, no, I just don't like you. And then you go, oh, you're a jerk, right? <laughs> But then you've got, but now you've got a reason to think that, right? Uh, before, so, so she, and, and she said to me, this nun, she said, if we had just asked, <laughs> you know, we just assumed she was being mean. But in fact, if we had said, sister, why are you closing all the windows? She'd say, because of the snakes. Then we would have avoided five years of resentment, Right? Um, which, is, which is, I guess, an, a, a way of introducing humility. Um, so this, uh, I, I'm now famous for my humility, and I gave myself an award, actually, not too long ago. It wasn't, wasn't big enough, so I made a bigger award for myself. Um, but more importantly, I wrote this book, and to the sort of, in a nutshell, uh, St. Benedict in Chapter 7 of the Rule he, he outlines what he says are the 12 steps of humility. And it turns out these 12 steps have been very, very useful for hundreds and hundreds of years, and they became the 12 steps that they use in AA. And there are all sorts of, all these 12 step programs actually ultimately derive from St. Benedict's 12 steps of humility. He says, the higher you climb, the lower you get, right? And it starts with fear of God, which is a sort of a negative virtue, if you want to think about it that way. And, it, and then you progress through these steps. And you can go back and revisit them and stuff like that. But it starts with the fear of God and self-denial, obedience, perseverance, repentance, serenity, self-abasement. Until finally you get to discretion, dignity, silence, reverence. The last step, of course, is, is about revering God. Um, and and I, I began to, to think about this in, in earnest uh, when I was appointed to become the cha- to be the chaplain at our high school because we had this great shrink this great uh, counselor named of all things Dr. Fury um, who, who's by the way who could, who really needs your prayers he now works exclusively with fallen priests. <laughs> And you want to talk about, he said to me not too long ago, he said, I've never had a job where people hated me for doing it. He's like, but they do now, right? So he needs prayers. I mean, he's, he's a great man, genius, uh, but, but he's doing a job no one wants. Um, for people that no one wants, um, not even their brother priests. Um, 
But in any case, he gave a talk to the school called Don't Let the Village Raise Your Child. And I thought this was just a brilliant way of turning the cliches on its head. And the next morning I, I, I saw, I, it became this sort of ritual. I would wake up in the morning and I'd say, good morning, Dr. Fury, how am I? And he'd say, what? I'd say, well, you're the psychiatrist, how am I? And he'd say, oh, I don't know, you got daddy issues maybe, I don't know. And he'd say, well, how am I? And, I, and he'd say, you're the priest. I'd be like, well, you know, maybe an exorcism or two, whatever. And then on my way out of the office, he'd say, follow your dreams. And I'd say, think outside the box. And he'd say, you're perfect just the way you are. And we'd, go, and we'd try to see who could end with the most cliches. Um, the, the, the idea being that these were things that we were hearing every day, you know, that people tell their kids that I think in the end are just going to turn them into these narcissistic, self-absorbed, empty-headed, you know, shallow, not, I mean, well, whatever, kids. Um, and then to make, I don't know, to put the icing on the cake, I ended up, I, I was at the pharmacy a few, uh, about a year later and um, get picking up drugs for one of the old guys and uh, and you know they have these self-help books on the shelf these sort of popular things on the shelf and one of them was called the teen's guide to self-esteem and the subtitle was learning to love the most important person in the world <laughs> you and I was like I pulled it off the shelf and I looked at this pharmacy and I was like this is the worst advice you could ever give a teenager. Like, they're, they already think they're the center of the world. Now, not only have you reinforced that, but you've upped the pressure. Like, and I went on and on and on. Finally, they gave me the book and asked me to leave. And, and I took it home and I flipped through it and I said, you know what, this is it. I, I'm, I'm writing my own book on self-esteem, which, spoiler alert, I don't believe in. Um, it, it ended up being on humility. Um, because, and not, not because I'm especially humble, but because I do hang out with guys who really are. And uh, in particular, well, I, I, I've also known, uh, I, I think, I, I'm, tr I'm, well, yeah, I'll tell you this. The, uh, humility is often, I think, confused with self-deprecation or, or, or this sort of obsequious, oh, I'm so terrible sort of thing. It's a sort of negative thing. But I, I had this friend at Oxford. I played rugby with him. He ended up becoming a Jesuit, God bless him. Uh, but he was a great rugby player. I once saw him knock a kid out and then drink his water when they brought it over to him. When he came. Uh, Now he's a Jesuit, go figure. Um, in St. Louis, he wrote, he, he said, I am now, he, he sent me a note and said, guess what, I've been appointed to the most prestigious high school in St. Louis. And I was like, well, wait a second, I don't remember losing my job. How'd you end up here? Um, but in any case, his, he lived in a castle, like literally. He was from, his family lived in a castle. And um, they invited me to come up and, and spend Christmas with them. And I didn't know they lived in a castle, um, but his mom came and picked me up, and she drove me up there. And in spite, I mean, I am utterly divorced from uh, any attachment to material possessions. But when we rounded the corner and I saw this incredible, like, five-story villa with its own golf course, tennis courts, Eucharistic adoration chapel, uh, I, I looked at it. And I said, that's your house? And she said, yeah. And I go, wow, <laughs> right? And Mrs. Hill looks at me and she goes, yeah, aren't we blessed, right? Which was, which caught me even more off guard than seeing the castle because, you know, you would think that she'd say something like, oh, well, you know, it's really hard to keep up or, or oh, but, you know, it's not what it seems or, well, sure, but, blah, blah, you know, no, no, it, uh, this, in, this has come to represent for me a, a certain form of humility that you, you acknowledge God's, she, this was a gift to her as much as anything. Like she was undeserving of this house, right? So she could really enjoy it. Like she, she's like, yeah, yeah, amazing, isn't it? In fact, a couple of years later, I had uh, her husband come and speak at the school. And he had just um, brokered a, uh, he had bought a business for $19 billion, right? So this is a guy who really knows money. And he gave a talk to the school, and 
one of the kids raised their hands afterwards for the question and answer, and the kid said, uh, so, Mr. Hill, um, you're pretty rich, huh? And he goes, and he says, yes. He's like, you know, I try to be detached, and I give a lot of it away, but yeah, you know, I've got a house in Saint Tropez, <laughs> you know. And he says, uh, you, but you say you're detached from the wealth. And he's like, yeah, I try to be. He goes, great, can I have some? <laughs> and I thought that, this is why I like teaching smart kids, because they, they have a way of putting you in your place. Um, and I thought he had him, but Mr. Hill, I think, had thought a lot about this and what he was doing. In fact, I know for a fact he had volunteered to give it all away to join Mother Teresa uh, in her work. Uh, and that's a whole other story. But he looked at this kid and he said, I'll tell you what, I'll go home and I'll pray about it. But I really doubt that the Holy Spirit is guiding me to give my money to random high school kids in St. Louis, Missouri. He's like, but it's precisely because it's not my money that I can't just give it away any way I please. I have to pray about this and really think about this. Um, and I, again, I, I think this is where, where, where real humility is, is that accepting your weaknesses, obviously being bluntly acknowledging your weaknesses, but also bluntly acknowledging your gifts, right? Uh, St. Uh, Justin Martyr said that... Um, or no, John Chrysostom said that when you downplay your gifts, you do God no service, <laughs> right? And, and I, was, I was actually talking about this at the, the last retreat I gave. I was telling this story about how I, I was on the swim team in high school, and at regionals every year, the same kid would beat me every year at regionals in breaststroke. And every year, he'd beat me, and every year, he'd get angry and throw his goggles across the room because... He hadn't hit his best time. And this, and I was like, you know, thanks a lot for that because you beat me, you know, and you're ungrateful for your success. Although someone in the audience pointed out that I, he was judging himself by himself and I was judging myself by him. <laughs> so it turns out I guess I was wrong. But, <laughs> but the point is that when you have a gift, it does God no justice to downplay it, to pretend like you don't. Um, anyway, step one, and now we begin the ladder of humility. Step one uh, of the, I'll just go through two of the steps on St. Benedict's ladder of humility. Uh, the first is the fear of God. And I think this is really, uh, this really is the place to start. It's not the place to finish, right? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. But if you can't, I tell the kids, if you can't feel the love, at least try to feel the fear, Right? Um, if you can't do a good thing for the right reasons, then do it for any reason, <laughs> you know. Do it out of fear of hell if you have to, but do the right thing. Um, so St. Benedict says, always have the fear of God before your eyes and avoid all thoughtlessness so that you are constantly mindful of everything God has commanded. Um, so when it comes to like self-esteem, you can't have that without self-respect and because you're made in the image and likeness of God, that means you start by respecting God, right? And I don't mean by that that God's like up there waiting to hit the smite button on his computer, you know, that he's out to get you. But then again, like, he's pretty big. <laughs> like, he's in, he's, uh, there, there's a great, oh, all of a sudden I'm reminded of a Monty Python routine where... The preacher, the preacher is saying something like, he, said, he starts off his sermon by saying, Oh Lord, you are so big. You are just so incredibly huge. Like, we're all really impressed down here. Let me tell you that much. And I mean, the, the truth is, like, God is great. And, and our, he weighs our souls. We have a monk in our monastery. He's a convert. He was Episcopalian. And he read Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which if you haven't ever read it, is really worth, he talks about us being like a spider on a thread held above a fire, and God's got the other end. And this, this is a Puritan from the 19th, 17th century, so he's a little, you know, over the top, but it scared him enough to get him thinking, and he ended up converting and becoming a monk, so... You know, it's again, it's the beginning of wisdom. Theosabia in Greek, God-fearing. Um, and I think these days we're likely 
Well, I think what, what, what C.S. Lewis wrote is probably very appropriate, that folks these days don't so much want a heavenly father, they want a heavenly grandfather, right? Like a sort of senile old guy who doesn't much care what the young folk do so long as nobody gets hurt, you know? And he probably won't remember it later anyway. Um, but you remember like what St. Peter said, did, when, when St. Peter met Jesus, the first thing he does is throws himself on his face. He says, get away from me. Like, I'm sinful. Like, I, I don't deserve to be here. Uh, and in, in, in our readings this morning, if you were at Mass, Solomon builds this immense, beautiful temple for God. And the first thing he says is, you know, God isn't here, right? <laughs> it's, it's sort of an odd thing for him to say. First thing he says, God doesn't dwell in this temple. God is too big to be in this temple. As magnificent as this temple is, God can't ever be contained in this, right? Um, so the, the first step is... Um, is God-fearing. And then the end step, obviously, is, is to love God. Um, so that first step, fear of God, is where you begin. And then, and then I, I'm going to skip forward a couple of steps to step three, which uh, I think is the second great American challenge. I mean, I think our first challenge is in fearing God. I, I, I think people tend to think of Jesus now as a uh, more of a sort of a group counselor, you know, and less of the the judge of the living and the dead who will come and uh, riding on the clouds with his name carved in blood on his thigh. I was talking with someone this morning that like, I'm, I think I, a good project would be to go and list all the things that Jesus says that are rude. <laughs> like, like you, you den of vipers, you whitewashed tombs, you like, it'd be better for you if, you if a millstone were tied around your neck and you were thrown in a lake. Imagine saying that to somebody. Like, we tend to think of Jesus as way too nice these days. Um, and, and I don't think that's necessarily what it's about. Kind, yes, and good, yes. But I don't know about nice. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong on that one. Um, but in any case, so step, the fear of God, though, is what guards against that kind of, uh, that, that taking him for granted. Actually, at the, youth, at the youth group meeting on Sunday night, I was talking about how a kid, I saw a kid in line at communion with a t-shirt that said, Jesus is my homeboy, right? And I thought, eh. except that there was a kid in the group whose name was Jesus, and he was like, well, maybe it was just his friend. I was like, oh, I never thought of that. Like, Jesus is my homeboy, yeah, okay, why not? You know? But in any case, um, that's neither here nor there. Um, step three, let's just move on before I say something I regret. Um, so step three is the other great, I think, American challenge, if you will, which is obedience, right? And nobody, I mean, teenagers, teenagers, obviously, this is a, a thorn in the side. But I think for all of us, Americans in particular, obedience is really, is really the great challenge. And so I entitled the step three, Don't Follow Your Dreams. Um, St. Benedict says, for the love of God, be obedient to your elders, imitating the Lord, of whom the apostle says he was obedient even unto death, right? And, and the, I, you know, again, I entitled this, Don't Follow Your Dreams, because everyone has dreams, right? And if we all followed all of our dreams, the world would collapse into chaos and ruin. I mean, some people have Unhealthy dreams, self-defeating dreams, stupid dreams, right? I'm not about to tell Jeffrey Dahmer to follow his dreams, right? Because some people have, have reckless or evil dreams, right? So, but, but, so the question is then, the question becomes, how do you know which dreams you should follow and which you shouldn't? I, um, well, you seek the advice of someone older and bigger and wiser than yourself. I um, actually... I, I think I have it on my computer. My students, let's see if I've got confession under homilies. My, my students, whenever I am too lazy or too ignorant to know the answer to one of their questions, I just give a group project. Um, and so I wasn't quite sure why they should go to confession, so I said to them, they, they were really, they were mysteriously fond of 
of top 10 lists this one year. And so I said, uh, give me a top 10 list of why to go to confession even if you don't want to. And let me see if I can find it here. Uh, the first five on the list were stupid. I remember that, so I won't go through those. Um, but, let's see, under homily, it's got to be in there somewhere. Confession. Oh, wait, if I say reasons, that might. Oop, no, that's resasms. Reasons. Should have thought of this ahead of time. Um, well, oh, there it is. Reasons for confession. Yeah, so the top ten reasons were, uh, number one was, nope, that's not it. Oh, well, okay, I, I'm, I'll, all right, see, now I've, it's like um, uh, starting a war in the Middle East. Once you've invested a certain amount of time, <laughs> once you've invested so much, there it is, okay, you kind of can't turn back, you just got to go with it. Um, Right, so the number five reason, and this is, if you haven't been to confession this week, go tomorrow, and here's why. According to the students of the, the senior class of St. Priory, or Priory High School in St. Louis, Missouri, number five reason to go to confession, even if you don't want to, is uh, you're not bigger than the church, okay? And the way they put it is, no matter how much time you spend thinking about it, the sum total of your wisdom does not add up to more than the sum total of the church's wisdom. You aren't holier than Mother Teresa. You're not smarter than Thomas Aquinas. You're not wiser than St. Francis. And you're not older than the church. So what are the odds that you're right and the entire Catholic church is wrong? <laughs> so that's number five. Number four reason is better safe than sorry. Uh, which I think is self-explanatory. Um, number three is the Bible says so. The letter of St. James says, confess your sins to one another. And, and they, they, they said, well, yeah, maybe we can confess our sins to each other, but there's no guarantee that guy's not going to tell everybody else in the class. So you might as well to somebody, go to somebody who loses his job if he tells anyone, right? Um, but you got to go tell, him, tell your sins to somebody because it says so. Uh, number two reason was don't be stupid. Um, and I'm not sure I under, let's see. Um, oh, here it is, yes. Uh, well, I am willing to grant that there is a possibility that your mother might tell you something that would do you harm. Oh, wait, no, here it is, sorry. Consi uh, let's say you haven't been to confession in a while and you don't really think it's necessary. Consider the logic of your position. I don't fully understand the church's teaching on confession, you say, or have to say, if you're going to be honest with yourself. The church's teaching on confession does not make sense to me, therefore I disobey it. If you followed this pattern of logic for too long, you'd be dead. Imagine if, as a child, you said to yourself, Mom said not to play in the street. I don't understand or agree with this decision, therefore I disobey it. Disobey it. Now... I'm willing to grant that there's a possibility that your, my, your, your mother might tell you something that would do you harm. Say, for example, she told you, son, beautiful day, go play in the street. In that case, you might do well to disregard her advice. But if she said, son, it is very important that you run out right now and play in the street, you might assume she knew something that you didn't. Maybe there's a thief in the house. Maybe there's a gas leak. Who knows? But if you decide not to obey something she specifically told you to do, there'd better be some amazing proof to the contrary. It's just, I don't know, you know, kids get it right every now and then. Um, even so, on what vast theological treasury does one draw in order to come to such a life-changing decision? And, and on a personal level, or, or uh, imagine going to a doctor for a physical and the doctor says, son, you have a life-threatening illness, and unless I give you this medicine, you will die. And you reply, excuse me, doc, but I've taken high school biology. <laughs> I think I'll just treat myself, right? This is, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the truth is, like, people are willing to take expert advice on, like, plumbing, right? But they won't, but when it comes to art or theology, all of a sudden, everyone's an expert, Right? I mean, look, when everyone says, when all the authorities in your faith tradition say, do this, like, before you just say, because 
And, and, and this is something I'm fond of telling the kids. You can always tell sloppy logic is on its way because somebody says, I just, and you're like, you might as well just fill in whatever malarkey you want after that because I just, like, I just think God wouldn't, you know, do, I just feel like, that means you haven't thought it through, right? But you're going to have a strong opinion anyway, right? And nobody cares what your strong opinion is if you haven't thought it through. Sorry. <clears throat> Anyway, so number, one's, number one reason to go to confession, according to the St. Louis Priory School Seniors, is superpowers. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it not only forgives the sins that you've remembered to bring to the sacrament, it also forgives the sins you forgot to bring, and it gives you power to resist sin in the future. People tend to think of it as sort of, uh, or my students tend to, well, one of my students thinks of it as antivirus software, that it gets rid of the viruses you've got and then gives you protection against future viruses. For the record, he also thinks of uh, baptism as receiving your operating system, marriage as an external hard drive, uh, Eucharist as the internet, what were the, confession is an upgrade of the operating system, and let's see, oh, oh, ordination is when you become a web server, and oh, the sacrament of sick is when you just got to take the computer into the shop, right? Might come back, might not. Um, anyway, <laughs> the point is that <laughs> obedience, to get us back to our original topic, obedience is what saves you from following the wrong dreams, okay? Um, I, it's, G.K. Chesterton said, we don't need a church that's right when we're already right. We need a church that's right when we're wrong, right? Wrong, right. Um, so obedience is what saves us from following the wrong dreams. And, and this is when, it, in this chapter of my book, I wrote a story that I then regretted writing and asked if they could take out of the manuscript. And the, my editor was like, no, this is everybody's favorite story in the book. And everyone asked about it. But... When I, when I first joined St. Louis Abbey, I decided I would never have another lustful thought, which lasted about like three minutes. And so I decided to put it off till my, my junior. And when I took my simple vows, I discovered that I wasn't any better prepared than, than before. So I was reading through the lives of the saints, and I got to St. Francis. And we all know what St. Francis did when he struggled with lustful thoughts, right? He threw himself in a rose bush. Well, St. Louis Abbey has a rose garden behind the monastery. And I thought, well, you know, I've tried a lot of other approaches. It worked for St. Francis. Why shouldn't it work for me? Well, it didn't work for me, as it turns out, because, I, well, I, I, I got myself to pull myself together, walked out and by, behind the monastery and jumped right in to Simeon's rose bush, forgetting that, that three really, really, really key factors. Uh, number one, that St. Francis threw himself into a wild rose bush. And wild roses have little tiny thorns, right? But the cultivated variety have big old sharp, long thorns, right? And, and, and so it hurt like you wouldn't believe I mean, you would believe. I mean, why I didn't think this through, I don't know. But, and then secondly, St. Francis was naked when he threw himself into the rose bush, which sounds like a bad idea until you're in the rose bush, right? And then every time you move, you're a little more stuck because it grabs another piece of your habit, right? And so every time I tried to get out of the rose bush, having suddenly realized I'd done something stupid again, that... I was even more stuck, right? And then thirdly, I forgot momentarily that St. Francis was a saint, all right? And I'm just Augustine, right? So what might have been a great idea for St. Francis was just stupid for me, right? So I, I anyway, I was stuck there in the rose bush for, I, gosh, what seemed like hours. It could only have been about 20 minutes or so before my novice master walked by, right? <laughs> And yeah, and he walked by. I mean, he was like, ah. 
<laughs> I'm like, a little help, you know? But he came back with the rest of the community and they all stood around and had a good laugh and pulled me out, gave me a new habit because of course I had ruined the habit they gave me. And then he sat me down in the novitiate and he said, listen, Brother Augustine, I admire this attempt at holiness, but before you try any further feats of asceticism, just check with me first, okay? Because we have all been there, right? And I was like, you, you were in the rosebush too? He's like, no, we weren't that stupid. <laughs> but we've all, been, we've all tried to do things that were stupid in our time. And, and so we, we, we know a thing or two about this life, right? Because even, even a good, even the best intentions, if they're not done under obedience, if you don't subject that to some higher authority, then you can really end up doing yourself more harm than good. And uh, when, I was, when I was a beach patrol lifeguard, there, uh, a friend of mine had a, a kid fall off of his pier. And, um, and his dad jumped in to save him. And he watched the dad getting ready to jump in, and he said, don't do it. Like, I've got this, right? But, and, and I'm not blaming the dad here, okay, because his dad, you know, your, your animal instinct takes over, right? But even so, the dad jumped in and pulled the kid to shore by the hair. And uh, the, the problem with that is that the kid had hit his head going down and had broken his neck. And I'm not saying, uh, we don't know whether it happened this way or not, but most certainly pulling him to shore by the hair did not help his broken neck, right? And so the kid was dead by the time they got to him. Now, I mean, you can't blame a dad for that right, obviously, but, but it's a classic case of wanting desperately to do the right thing, but not acknowledging authority, right, and we can, you can, you can't blame a guy for wanting to save a child, right, but if you can't do that under obedience to someone who knows better, you can end up doing a lot of harm. Um, now, St. Benedict actually distinguishes between three kinds of obedience. There's obedience to God, which trumps everything, right? Obedience to God is first, last, first, foremost, above all. Uh, but there's also obedience to your superiors, which I talked about. And that, and, but, but obedience to God is impossible unless you can hear God. <laughs> and you can't hear God without silence. Um, and so the monk's primary mode of prayer, our, our whole life is oriented to listening. And listening, right, is, is impossible without silence. So some, some people think monks take a vow of silence, which is totally ridiculous, right? If you took a vow of silence and the monastery was burning down, you'd run around going, you know, and then everybody'd die. So we don't take a vow of silence, but we do prefer silence because it's impossible to hear God speaking without it. I, um, my very first experience of, um, sil uh, of the power of silence came when I was a um, janitor working in this monastery in Rome. Um, I, I, I was working as an archaeologist, and I met this monk on a bus. Actually, I'll tell you that story. That's kind of funny. It has nothing to do with silence, but I'll tell it to you anyway. I was on this bus, and there was this great big monk on the other side of the bus, and he's six foot six. It turns out he and I became really good friends later. I hadn't, I didn't even know monks existed at that moment. I just thought he looked strange. And he was on the other end of the bus. And there was a, it, this was in Rome where the pickpockets are very plentiful. And there was a pickpocket on the bus trying to pick his pocket. And when you see a borsegitore doing his thing, you don't just say to everybody on the bus, there's a pickpocket because then he panics and somebody might get hurt. So instead, what you do is you, you sidle up next to him and you give him a shove, right? And that way, he knows you know. And then he also bumps into the person he's trying to rob. So that guy is suddenly alerted. And then he gets off at the next stop. No harm, no foul, right? So I, I, I worked my way through and I gave the guy a shove and he bumps into the monk. And the monk totally didn't notice. So I shoved him again. And, and this time, the pickpocket looked at me like, 
I'm trying to do my job and he doesn't care. So what's your problem? So the third time I tapped the monk on the shoulder. I'm like, scusi, questo è un bersagliatore. He says, are you an American? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, this is a pickpocket. He's trying to steal from you. He goes, yeah, I don't have any pockets. I thought it was funny, <laughs> right? So that was my first encounter with monasticism, that sort of bizarre monk humor. Um, but I get, he eventually got me this job working as a janitor in his monastery. And um, this is in Rome, where every couple of weeks, all the electricity goes out because, you know, because... Because the electric company is run by Italians. And like, you know, every couple of weeks they all decide to take a coffee break or something. I don't know. But the point is that all the electricity went out for three and a half hours. When it came back on, there was a monk in the elevator, an older guy. And, and, they, and everybody panicked and they grabbed us, the janitors, and we pried open the, the doors and we pulled him out. And, and we were sweating and angry and frustrated. When we pulled him out, he was just beaming. He's like this 80-year-old dude. He's been stuck in the elevator for three and a half hours, and he's just like, hey. And, and I remember, I distinctly remember saying to him, what is your problem, right? And he said, problem? He said, I just spent three and a half hours in an elevator. As if that answered my question. And, and so I pushed a little further uh, to explain. He said, look, I gave up everything to pursue a life of silent contemplation and then I fill it up with things to do and things to say and prayers to do. And he's like, here I was. It was pitch black. I had nothing to see, nothing to do, nowhere to go. I couldn't hear anything. He's like, it was just the purest prayer I've had in months. And I went back to my room that night and I wrote in my journal, uh, I could never be a monk. But there's a power there that I want, right? That like... That, that takes what would have been like unbearable for me and turns it into the high point of his year, right? Like whatever that is, I want it. Um, like the next time that guy is stuck in traffic, he's gonna be like, oh, great. <laughs> right, the next time he's stuck in line at the grocery store behind somebody who won't pay fast enough, he's like, oh, good, right? Like the most frustrating moment of my week is the high point of his week and I wanna figure that out. And it wasn't until my novitiate that I really sort of began to sort through this. I took a, a class with one of our old monks, a guy named Father Timothy Horner. If you've ever heard of little Jack Horner who sat in the corner. Oh, I told you him, about him, didn't I? No? Well, little Jack Horner was his great, 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 great grandfather. It, uh, Ronald Knox died in his family home. Anyway, Father Timothy is this great old man. Uh, well, was, he's dead now, but he, um, he was special forces during World War II as a shock of red hair, even all the way at 96, he had bright red hair, and a genius, top of his class at Oxford, and he taught me how to translate the rule from Latin, and every day I was late. I mean, every day I, was, I had my homework half done, and I'd stumble into class with an excuse, and I'd be like, I'm so sorry, I messed up the sacristy work, I had to go do it twice, blah, blah, blah. and he'd be sitting there like this. <laughs> and he'd wait till I was finished, and he'd say, are we quite ready? And I'd say, yes, Father. And then he'd say, in the name of the Father, so and we begin. Um, and this happened like every day. And what people don't know about like late people is that we really do regret it every time we're late. Um, so I eventually, over time, I eventually was on time for class, and eventually, and toward the end of my novitiate, I made it to class early, and it turned out Father Timothy was late. And, and so I moved all my books onto his side of the table, and, excuse me, and, uh, and when he came in with his books, he's like, I'm so sorry I'm late. I was at a funeral and it went over and I was sitting there like this. <laughs> Waited till he was done and I go, are we quite ready? <laughs> and he just looked at me and he took a little white piece of paper out of his pocket and he pushed it across the table to me and it said, silence is the first language of God. <laughs> and I, I, until pretty recently I had that stuck to the wall over my bed 
Because, you know, we do have a tendency to fill our lives with just noise, you know? I mean, I, I remember before I became a monk, I could, I'd wake up in the morning to my clock radio. I'd make breakfast while I was listening to the radio, watch TV while I was eating breakfast, get in the car, turn the radio on, go to work, come back with the car, run with my earbuds in. I had a, sh- I had a radio in the shower, for crying out loud. I could make it months with no silence whatsoever, which is a great tragedy if you think to yourself that silence is the first language of God, right? I mean, before there was anything, God was communicating. There's three people in the Trinity. They were obviously having some sort of conversation, but it wasn't with noise, right? Um, And if you think, well, another thing Father Timothy taught me was that the scriptures are God's language of silence translated into a language we can understand, which is a whole nother business. Um, so, so the first, the, our first obligation is to listen to God and that requires silence. And then the second, uh, obligation is to listen to our superiors, which entails obedience. And the third and last, um, option or, or, or form of obedience is I think the most difficult. And that's the sort of window open, window closed obedience. What, what St. Benedict calls mutual obedience, um, and that's not necessarily, that's where apologies come in. <laughs> and it's not necessarily um, clear. It's not, it's not easy to understand what your brothers are telling you to do. Um, I'll just, you know, I, I think I, I did say I would take questions. And if there are none, then I'll, I'll go through a bit of scripture with you. But uh, I'll, I think I'll end with, with this little story about... Um, mutual obedience and apologies I every mo- my monastery some monasteries they am I over going over time by the way or am I on time I've still got like 20 minutes right okay good um every monastery well not most monasteries do not leave the wa- the clothes washing up to the monks themselves uh but my monastery does and we share a washroom and we all wash our own clothes and we share an iron which is always broken because someone is always dropping the iron. And, and I went in to iron my habit not too long ago. And when I picked the iron up off of the ironing board, the front fell off. And the water poured out. And the buttons fall, fell off. And, the, and all I was left with was like wires and a handle. <laughs> and I was looking at this. And, I, and it just... Again, I spent a lot of my life being angry at people for things they didn't or did do. And I, I thought to myself, you know, someone obviously had broken the iron, right? And then sort of balanced it on the board so that the next guy would think they broke it, right? Uh, or maybe somebody would kick the iron or something. I guess they had hoped. And by the time dinner came, I was really steamed. And we have this tradition in the monastery of making announcements after dinner. And I had rehearsed it. I was like, someone broke the iron and balanced it on the ironing board so someone else would come along and think they'd broken it. And that someone should really own up to having broken the iron. Here I am, you know, the, the big wise guy. And, and good old Father Rafe, who's 78, raised, sheepishly raised his hand and acknowledged that he had done it. And after dinner, he came over and he apologized and he said, it turns out Father Rafe had broken the iron and had pieced it back together again with what he thought was super glue and turned out to be ear, eye drops. <laughs> so now who's the jerk, Right. Which actually kind of brings us back to the fundamental attribution error, right? Like, I assume that it's because he's a jerk, right? In fact, it's because he's sort of senile. (laughs) Uh, Or or at least can't tell the difference between eye drops and superglue. Anyway, so I I think I'm going to stop there for now. And if there are questions, I can take them. Otherwise... I thought I would go through one little passage of scripture that was important to me as far as my discernment and and listening to God and listening to the first language of God and that kind of stuff. But before I do, is does anybody got anything that's been just burning a hole in their head? A question, in other words. 
No? If not, then we're going to end with like a little meditation on scriptures, the way monks do it. Well, okay. All right, then. Um, what, what, I, what, I, what I thought I would do, uh, since we're talking about obedience and fear of God, um, when I had my first of many vocation crises, I, um, I went to old Father Patrick, who is my go-to man in times of distress, and I told him that I was leaving the monastery. And I said, Father Patrick, I just dropped by because I'm leaving. And he said, oh, today? <laughs> and I said, well, no. And he said, okay, well, be a good monk today and then leave tomorrow. <laughs> and, and I said, yeah, but um, I'm not, I, the, the thing is, I'm just not at all sure that this is the place for me to be. I mean, God may, may want me somewhere else, right? And he goes, well, I mean, you're not somewhere else, are you? <laughs> and I said, well, no, but it's still, it's very hard to know God's will. And he said, well, why don't, you know, leave if you got to leave, but stick to the facts at least, right? Because in, in the monastery, we have this, expression called looking over the wall, right? Where you're like, what are they doing over there? You know, what, what are they doing? You know, the monks have this great temptation to look over the wall, right? Um, to, in fact, I shouldn't tell you this story, but I'm gonna. Um, about a, a month after my, no, it wasn't even that long. It must have been within, a, within the month. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. I, was, it, I, was t I took one of the cars to fill it up with gas and this guy pulls up in a black BMW and jumps out and hands me a $50 bill. And I took it from him and I said, well, I don't really need this. I'm a monk. He's like, it's okay. It's like, I was in the seminary. He's like, I left because I didn't think I could handle the celibacy. And he gets back in his car and he pulls up alongside him. He rolls down the window and he goes, then I got married and found out I could. Right? <laughs> and and I, I'm like... You've said this before, haven't you? He's like, every priest I see. <laughs> and this, was, this little encounter has come to mean a lot to me because, you know, we have a tendency to look over the wall and be like, I wonder what it's like to be, you know, to be married to her or what it's like, what he's like. It's, like, you know, it's tough all around, I, think. I have a feeling. Um, at any rate, back to, the, so, so sticking to the facts is what, uh, what was Abbot Patrick's um, advice to me, which didn't make any sense. So, of course, he pulled out his Bible, and he flipped through to, I think it's the Gospel of Matthew, and he read me the story of the man born blind. And, and I'll, I'll read a little bit of it to you. Um, his neighbors and those who had seen him earlier as a beggar, see, Jesus, of course, finds the man born blind. He, cure, he tells him to put mud on his eyes, and then go wash in the pool of Siloam. When he comes back, he can see, Right? So his neighbors and those who'd seen him earlier as a beggar said, isn't this the one who used to sit and beg? Some of them said, it is. But others said, no, he just looks like him. And he said, I am. They said to him, so how are your eyes opened? He replied, that man called Jesus, he made clay and anointed my eyes and told me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went there and washed and was able to see. And they said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. By the way, it's generally believed that this guy was a teenager, right? Because he's so annoying. And he's such a smart aleck. Um, and, of course, at, at a certain point, they, well, they call his parents, and they're like, oh, he's old enough to speak for himself, right? And anyway, he says, I don't know. Um, they brought the one who was once blind to the Pharisees. Now, Jesus had made clay and opened his eyes on the Sabbath. So the Pharisees are also... Uh, who also asked him how he was able to see. He said, he put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and now I can see. So some of the Pharisees said, this, is, this man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a sinful man do such signs? And there was division among them. So they said to the blind man again, what do you have to say about him since he opened your eyes? He said, he's a prophet? Now, the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and gained his sight until they summoned the parents. They asked them, is this your son? How does he do it? See, his parents said, we know this is our son and that he is born blind. We don't know how he sees now, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, 
he's of age, he can speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid. Uh, for, uh, because, uh, give God praise. He said, we know, they, they, the Pharisees said to him, we know this man is a sinner. Give God praise. He replied, look, if he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know is that I was blind and now I see. So they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He said to them, I told you already and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You want to become his disciples, right? They ridiculed him and said, you are that man's disciples. We are disciples of Moses, blah, blah, blah. The man said to him, oh, this is amazing that you do not know where he is from, yet he opened my eyes, right? Uh, blah, blah, they answered him, uh, you were born totally, oh, no, I don't know what the guy said. They, they said, you were born totally in sin. And he, finally he says, what, do you want to be his followers? Right, and that's when they beat him up and throw him out. When Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, he found him and said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered and said, who is he? <laughs> Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, I do believe, Lord, and he worshipped him. Right? So Abbot Patrick took, Father Patrick took me through this passage, and he said, listen to this guy. He doesn't have any faith, right? He doesn't have a lot going for him, right? He just, every time they ask him, he just says, I don't know. I was born, I was blind, now I can see. He just repeats the same phrase over and over again. Even Jesus himself finally finds him and says, do you believe? He goes, I don't know. But the one thing this guy has going for him is that he sticks to the facts, right? Is that he believes what is right in front of him. Right, and he says, "Let's re, let's re, let's imagine ourselves in this passage, and you're you're the man born blind, and you you come to Jesus, and you say, uh, and Jesus says, you're look, you say, who is the son of man? You're looking at him, and let's imagine that he said, yeah, but maybe my blindness was psychological, or how do I know you're the man who cured me? I never saw you to begin with, hmm? or I mean, he could have said anything, right? Or or how do you know it wasn't psychological? How do you know there wasn't something in the mud?" How do I know it wasn't the Pharisees that actually cured me? And I just, you know, they were nearby at the time. How do I know that? The point is, this guy sticks to the facts. Um, which is, and this is, this is how monks pray the scriptures. We listen to it, right? Listen, says St. Saint, says, uh, Benedict, with the ear of your heart. So I think, I think that's where I'm going to stop today. Um, well, yeah, because uh, tomorrow I want to talk about decision making and the Desert Fathers and how to, how to listen to God's will. Um, so let us pray in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Um, God, give us, give us the patience and the will to listen to your voice in the silence of our hearts. Okay, wait, I'm stopping. I'm time out. Sorry, God. He and I are cool. Um, no, no, sorry, we're good, we're good, we're back. No, well, okay, I'm writing a book on decision making in case you couldn't tell. That, uh, well, I, I went through the Jesus prayer with the kids and I'm trying to decide right this second whether to go through it again, but I think we're sort of, we're pretty well out of time, aren't we? I mean, I don't, yeah, okay, quickly then I'll go through it. Okay, this is, this is just real turbo crash course in monastic silent prayer, okay? Here, rule number one is that, uh, I mean, the most powerful prayer ever, the only perfect prayer we have is the Eucharist, right? So when all else fails, go to Mass, right? I got in trouble, like, um, when I took homiletics, I took it from a terrible professor at Kenrick Seminary, and, and he only gave us one sermon to give the whole year of class, the whole six month, three months of class. And, uh, and so I decided to preach on the, the donkey of Balaam. Oh, yeah, we, I just met a donkey this afternoon. I wasn't, you know, her donkey, not she is a donkey. Um, but uh, Balaam's ass, I decided to preach on Balaam's ass because I thought, well, what the heck, we might as well have some fun with this since it's a stupid class anyway. And uh, the refrain was, when it, because you see, Balaam, this is the only talking animal in the Bible, by the way, is Balaam's ass. And Balaam is trying to get to Israel, 
But the donkey stops, and he keeps kicking the donkey, and the donkey says to him, why are you kicking me? There's an angel standing there, right? So I'm like, no matter what you do, you got to get your ass moving. That's the point. Like, we Catholics, we've got to get our asses in gear, right? And then I had all the seminarians saying, get your ass to mass, get your ass to mass. And I made a C minus in that class, but, but it was totally worth it. What do I care? Um, so what was that about? Um, man, I don't even know where that came from. And I've no, this is the, anyway, um, Jesus prayer? Yeah, okay, so, oh, right, at, get your, yeah, the mass, right, so the mass is the only perfect prayer we have, so that's, that's the, that's the first and most important prayer. The second most important prayer is scripture, and the most important word in scripture is the name of Jesus, right, this is, this is the word above all other words, the most powerful word, the one passage of scripture you can repeat endlessly with infinitely powerful results. Um, in fact, I, um, if you look at the Old Testament, it's, if you read through the Old Testament, and someday, if you get the chance, read, th read it through beginning to end, like one big story. And a couple of things will stand out. One is, they're really big on keeping the the Lord's Day holy. Like, that's huge in the Old Testament, keeping the Lord's Day holy. Don't work on the Sabbath. Honor God on the Sabbath. Do that, like, over and over and over and over and over and over again. And the other thing that'll strike you is that there's this moment, this turning point in the history of Israel. The absolutely crucial moment is when God reveals to Moses his name, right? That this is, and this is, my, my own background is in archaeology and ancient history and ancient literature. And so I've read a lot of, you know, Sanskrit and Greek and Latin and whatever. And, and there are all these ancient epics. And they all talk about how heroic their ancestors were, except when you get to the Old Testament, the Israelites. But the, the main thing that, one of the things that keeps coming up is about the power of knowing someone's name. Right? In Jewish mysticism... Uh, knowing someone's name gives you power over them. And it's the, one of the legends is that Solomon knew the names of the demons, which is why he was so powerful. Um, but but in, in ancient Greek myth, for example, uh, Odysseus, his great turning point is when he reveals his name to the Cyclops. And now the Cyclops can curse him. Um, so the, 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 and the ancient Egyptians, they would, when they'd write their name out, they would surround it with a sacred knot so that no one could curse it, right? So, and even today, if I say your name, it gets your attention. Like, you, you have power, if I, identity theft, right, is a way to get power over people. Uh, so when God reveals his name to Moses, this is, this is a major, major moment. He's giving a group of humans the power to command his undivided attention at will, right? And, and it's so sacred and so powerful that no pious Jew dares to utter that word out loud, right? Because actually, you don't want God's undivided attention, right? I, in fact, I have this friend named Jordan, who's an Orthodox Jew. He's a great benefactor of the monastery, and he and I discuss, debate scripture every now and then. And he was explaining to me that the you can kind of tell the good guys from the bad guys in scripture because the good guys have the name of God in their name. The bad guys have names like Jerubbaal, Jerobaal, right? Baal in their names. Um, uh, but, but the good guys have, and I was like, Elijah, 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 oh, Elijah, Yahweh. And I looked at him and he's going, I was like, what? And I go, oh my God, I just said the name, didn't I? And he said, yeah. I was like, you've never heard it pronounced, have you? He's like, no. <laughs> like, it, I mean, he had never heard this word pronounced out loud, right? Because it is so sacred and so powerful. But see, to Christians, we have the name of God, right? Because God became man. God was a, a human being, and people had to get his attention. And the name of Jesus has all the same power of the sacred name, the, the tetragrammaton, Yahweh, 
except that you can say it any time you want, all day, every day, right? So the ancient monks, I've got two and a half minutes to tell you this, the ancient monks, the very, very first monks who ran out in the desert, their idea was to pray without ceasing, to pray without stopping. And, um, and so they went to the scriptures and they said, well, we can't do this except uh, unless we're full of the Holy Spirit. So where do we, so they found this passage in St. Paul that says, at the name of, uh, no, um, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the power of the Spirit, right? So easy way to stay full of the Holy Spirit is to just say Jesus is Lord, except that I just quit saying it, right? So now I'm not full of the Holy Spirit, so I have to say it again, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. So, so these monks would walk around all day, every day, saying, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. Except, of course, that they were always plagued by demons, right? The demon of anger or lust or greed or whatever. And, and the problem was that they were constantly being distracted. Um, so they went back to the scriptures and they found St. Paul saying again, at the name of Jesus, every knee must bend in heaven and on earth, and get this, under the earth. So every time you start to be bothered by some demon, you say, Lord Jesus. And the demon's got to take a knee. I'm, I want to punch that guy, Lord Jesus. <sighs> but don't you really want to punch him, Lord Jesus? Okay. <laughs> but you're really Jesus? All right. <laughs> but I, Jesus, oh, come on. Right? So they keep saying this over and over and over and over again. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. And, they wrote, and there's this book that was written in the 19th century called The Way of the Pilgrim. It says you should say it 19,000 times a day just to be safe. <laughs> Which I don't think I've ever made it past like 200 if I can even count that high. And, um, but here's the thing. Uh, it, it's Once you start saying it over and over again, it becomes part of your breathing, part of your... It's sort of like an earworm, right? It's, it's back there all the time, right? Earworm is, is, I think, kid talk for a song that you just can't get out of your head, right? It becomes an earworm. And, and, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this, one, with, well, it isn't much of a story. Uh, Father Luke, who I've told you about, was on his deathbed. In the monastery, we, when a monk is dying, when we know he's dying, two monks will sit, one on either side of him, and pray for him as he dies, it's St. Urban, no, Saint, Pope Urban VIII, who led one of the Crusades and did all sorts of horrible things, was famously, this is the way he died, with two cardinals. And he said, I give thanks to God that he allows me to die like he did, with a thief on my left and on my right. And I said, <laughs> I said yeah. And one of them said, don't you want to forgive your enemies, your eminence? And he said, I've killed all my enemies. I don't need to forgive them. <laughs> but in any case, I like Urban VIII. Pray for him. He, he gave us the Sistine Chapel. No, wait, was that a word? Okay, who cares? The point is, I was sitting there next to Father Luke and uh, praying for him, and he was in a coma, and, I, I, and his lips were moving, and I kept getting closer and closer and looking at him, and sure enough, he was sitting there, sound asleep, in a coma, going, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, Lord Right? Like, he had done the, so it is possible to pray without ceasing, and, and this is how monks enter into silence, is by putting Jesus at the center of the prayer. Because, of course, if Jesus is not there at the center, it's not prayer at all. Okay? So, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. God our Father, give us patience. Give us silence. Give us a love of silence and a patience for silence. And help us to learn to speak your holy language and to read your scriptures in that silence that listens with the ear of the heart. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. St. Theodorus Tyro, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your patience.